Here we go. I apologize to everybody that we uh, did not get started as quickly. Um, we were having a little bit of technical difficulties, thought we were running up and running for the past 10 minutes, only to realize we had not yet been live. So I, I do apologize for the delay. Um, do you want to do a, a quick intro video to DSI, and then I'll just give an intro to the logistics of the webinar and, and then hand the balance of the time over to Ramesh. So quickly enjoy our, our little promo video. And thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Defense Systems Information Analysis Center, or DSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DOD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. DSIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the defense systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the defense systems domain of DOD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the Defense System's DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD Defense Systems research. Well, thank you guys for joining. Um, hope you enjoyed that quick promotional video about DSI. If you do have any other um, questions or, or curiosities about DSI, I would encourage you to go to the website for more information, uh, dsiac.org. Um, you can find more information there or, or contact any of us with DSI. Um, again, my name is Brian Benish. I'll just spend a, a moment here giving you a quick introduction to the Any Meeting platform while Ramesh shares his screen to bring his slides up for the presentation. Um, and as he's doing that, uh, if you were looking at your at the any meeting platform, you'll notice up in the top middle of the screen should be a little dialogue icon that you can use for submitting questions. So at any point during the presentation, if you have any questions, I would encourage you to click that, submit them, and then at the end of the presentation, we will um, go through the Q and A or go through a Q and A portion in the order that they're received. Um, I do want to distinguish that from the chat feature, which is also part of the any meeting platform. Um, if please try not to use your the chat for submitting questions. If you do have any technical questions that we want to address at the Q&A, use that, that question um, portal and form, from, again, at the top middle of your screen. And then finally, if you have any technical difficulties, uh, you can either dial in by phone and then uh, follow along with the slides that are available on our website. If you find this webinar's webpage on our website, the slides are directly downloadable from there. Um, and then if all else fails, you, we are going to be recording this and making it available so you could always watch it later on at your convenience if you do have any other issues. So uh, with that said, and without any further ado, I'm going to hand the balance of the time over to Ramesh for his presentation, and I will chime back in in Q&A. So Ramesh, floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Brian. Uh, this certainly feels like Groundhog Day because I was like 10 minutes into the presentation before we realized that we weren't on air. <laughs> so apologize for that. Uh, my name is Ramesh, and I work for the Center for High Assurance Computer Systems of the Naval Research Laboratory. I've been doing this for about, about 20 years plus. Um, my group is called the High Assurance Tactical Systems Engineering Group, or HATC, and I'm going to talk about what our contributions are to the for fighting the fight for naval warfare and how we plan to uh, address the autonomy problem. Um, so a brief introduction to, to, to uh, my background. I have held several research positions uh, at different laboratories around the world. I did my bachelor's degree in India, and then I got my master's from the Technical University of Eindhoven. And I primarily did all my research work at the Phillips Research Laboratories in Eindhoven. Unfortunately, that laboratory is closed down. And then um, I went off to... Um, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in, in Bombay, where I did a research in software engineering, uh, communications, and um, networking. 
And I was later um, manager systems and networking at Stanford University, where I was running um, uh, remote access um, bibliographic information processing system for a consortium. And we um, built multilingual terminals uh, for the first time ever. And we had cataloging workstations at the Library of Congress for cataloging non-Roman script books and other articles. I later did my uh, PhD work at the Communications Research Laboratory in um, Hamilton, Ontario, but I also worked at the AT&T Bell Laboratories in Murray Hill under the stewardship of um, Dr. Ritchie and others uh, on um, protocol verification and formal methods. I also spent a year at uh, Fraunhofer Focus in Berlin, the home of the MP3 and the MPEG-4, and um, had some really interesting interactions uh, funded by the Navy. I've also taught at a number of places, including um, the National Center for Software Technology, where our courses are still kind of like the gold standard for accrediting and um, qualifying professionals in the software industry. And I've spent uh, my years at NRL in modeling and sim of electronic warfare systems. Now we are doing modeling and simulation of underwater vehicles, including side scan sonar and um, SAS, which is synthetic aperture sonar systems for MCM. And I've also worked on uh, the SPS 49 and Slick 32 programs of record. And currently I work on the acquisition programs of um, the SPI 6 V123, which are the systems that are going to go on the next 20 plus ships for the Navy. So this is interesting work. Um, so we are looking for disruptive innovations in these um, in the engineering of these systems, and it seems like um, applying AI is the way to get what we call low code. So assurance can be achieved by performing machine learning because we don't have to code it. Um, but then there are attendant problems with this approach, and I'm going to talk about that during the presentation. And just as a kind of um, introduction to the portfolio of products that we are maturing from demonstrations and research prototypes into programs of record. They include uh, tactical cross-domain systems, which are um, devices that are used to pull data back and forth between different classification enclaves, uh, which is extremely important for um, continued operation in the presence of um, degraded or defunct sensors um, being um, degraded because of adversarial actions. EW systems, um, malware detection and classification using machine learning, AMDR and ESAR are the programs of record uh, for which we are applying machine learning for several things, including scheduling and uh, tactical sensor networks, because now with um, area access uh, problems the Navy is encountering in the, uh, in the domains of regard, uh, we have to sense remotely and pipe this data to platforms that are 1500 miles away or more. And so hey, tactical sensors are extremely important. Hey, Ramesh, uh, just so you're aware, it looks like you're only showing slide one still from the uh, the PowerPoint view. Oh, really? Yeah, so I, I suspect if you are doing presentation mode, it's not coming through right now. The only thing that's being shown is the, the PowerPoint application. Oh, okay, so let me get out of presentation mode. Now do you guys see this? Yep. Yeah, okay. maybe it's safe just to keep it like so that. So when I go to presentation mode, it doesn't advance? It doesn't, uh, not from our perspective. So you maybe just keep it like this, if that's okay. Okay, maybe I should just keep it like this. Okay. Thanks. All right. Oh, yeah, I apologize for that. Um, okay, um, so do you want me to switch back to presentation mode for a trial, or you think it's better not to? No, I think if, if we can see it like this, we'll probably better just to keep it as is, as long as that's okay with you. Well, I've got animations, so that's the reason why I thought it might help. But that's okay. Mm. Yeah. Can't help it. All right. Anyway, people have got copies of the slides, so it's I'm not deviating from that deck that I sent. Right. Okay. All right. So um, there was a recent news report where it said a prototype unmanned aircraft in a Lauda Airspeeder Mach 2 was lost during a demonstration flight, which eventually resulted in a flyaway and, and a crash. So it was a remotely piloted craft. It wasn't autonomous by any means, but then it gained autonomy because the remote pilot lost control 
And then, of course, there was a kill switch, which was activated, but had no effect. The craft, of course, now, without any guidance or control, just climbed up to 8,000 feet into controlled airspace. And then it just crashed in a field of crops, just about 100, 150 feet from occupied houses, and then outside of its designated operating area. So what's the lesson we can learn? I mean, you can get a detailed analysis of this accident from the UK website uh, where they did a, a post-mortem analysis. But the, the whole idea was that the, the software for this system was so poorly constructed that it was uh, inevitable that something like this uh, had to happen. Now, the point I'm trying to bring across is if you take a look at the kill switch, whose picture, unfortunately, I do not have, any layperson should be able to look at that switch and say, of course, this is not going to work because, you know, it had a, a USB plug and it had a naked circuit board with wires crossing all over it. And so they said, well, if this is how you build a switch, no wonder you can't activate it. But then if you show people software saying, OK, this is the software that's running on this machine, then they say, well, I don't know. Is it going to work or is it not going to work? And even experts like me. You know, I've been working in the software industry for over 30 years. I can't tell whether or not that software has been built according to standards and is um, able to withstand incidents like this or uh, not go cra crazy in situations like this. So that's what we are trying to do. So we said, okay, in which case, what are we going to do? We are just going to like not write software at all. Okay, and that's what machine learning is all about. So if you look at the, again, there was animation here, which could better explain this whole thing. But now that there's no animation, you'll have to kind of get all confused first before maybe I can deconfuse you by telling you exactly what I had in mind. So if you just concentrate on the box below versus the box above, it tells you the difference between what I call software 1.0 and software 2.0. So the traditional programming versus machine learning. So in traditional programming, you take the, input and you take a program and you perform a computation. It could be an Excel spreadsheet where the input is your data, program is all the Excel rules that you've coded in, you run it through Excel and then you're gonna get the results of all the cells being populated by the answers. On the other hand, machine learning is about taking pairs of input data and desired results, just taking them in pairs and then performing some computation which will then result in a program that can then classify other inputs according to the quote unquote rules that it has learned based on the pairs that you present during the learning process. So then, you know, imagine this arrow suddenly zigzagging its way over to that program on, at the top. So essentially the, the phase below is called learning or training as they call it. And then the, the box above is what we call inferencing which is similar to traditional programming, except that the program has been con uh, um, conceived and um, quote unquote written by this computational engine below, uh, based purely upon the pairs of data that you supply to it. This um, distinction between data that is supplied to the machine for learning purposes is called uh, training data. And then the, the things that you actually want to work the the problem on is called test or real life data, if you will. And then of course I will uh, talk about the distinction shortly and you'll get the results. So therefore there's no programming. There's of course a lot of programming in terms of infrastructure development and such like, but there is no programming on in the, along the same lines as what you would do if you were to perform traditional computation. So that's the, the whole idea. So although it's very enticing, uh, there are a number of problems associated with this, and I will go into that in somewhat more detail. But I think it's important to realize that one thing that has sort of stood out among all the different approaches to this machine learning is what is called a perceptron or a neuron. And so in, in essence, it's it's really the, the term neuron has been coined by biologists who thought this was a model of the human brain. And then of course we know that the human brain is, or in fact, even an animal brain or the brain of a nematode is way more complex than this, what we have simulated on the computer, but it does very well in terms of solving some engineering problems, but it's by no means a way to model the activities of the brain. And I will get to this in somewhat more detail in the next slide. 
So this is a perceptron, also known as a neuron. I would say wrongly known as a neuron. And all it really does is, you know, high school math. So if there are two inputs, X1 and X2, it just multiplies X1 by a weight, which is just a number, W11, and then it takes X2 and multiplies it by W12, and it adds another term known as a bias term, B1, and then it passes that through some function. So the, the one on the top right is called a sigmoid function. So you just pass this through this nonlinearity. So given the output, you just read off the, the value on the y-axis, and you say this is the output of the neuron. Now, people say, wow, is this all there is to it? Yes, there is. And in fact, this was invented by a fellow called um, Rosenblatt. And um, the traditional AI researchers in those days, like in the 50s, were up in arms against this whole approach. They said, this is not going to work. And, you know, Herb Simon and McCarthy and all these fellows, you know, and including, you know, von Neumann, who also um, proposed this symbolic approach to AI versus what we call the connectionist approach that we are seeing here. And so Rosenblatt was blasted. Um, so so to the extent to which these researchers went against his work is exemplified by the fact that um, Mr. Minsky and uh, in collaboration with another fellow called Seymour Papert, they wrote a book called Perceptrons showing how poorly this thing can even work to solve real world problems. Okay, so that's the extent of their vitriol, if you will. Um, and so I had two things. I had one, one uh, a demo of the perceptron, which I cannot show, unfortunately, um, due to you know restrictions of this platform. And um, I also had uh, pictures showing you Mr. Uh, the face of Mr. Um, Rosenblatt, which you can Google yourself and find out um, how he programmed this. But he adjusted all these weights. So if you look at these weights, he adjusted all these weights by hand and he had hundreds of these things. And there were you know, thousands of these inputs and he had to connect all these different perceptrons together. And, and his um, area of expertise was in um, optical character recognition, which in this day and age, it's kind of mundane, but he was trying to read these cards, you know, punched cards that were going into IBM systems. He wanted a, a computer program that can read this thing automatically. And that's what he was using perceptrons for. And good news, this is funded by the Office of Naval Research, or was, and so is my research. So, you know, you should be very proud. The Navy invented this pretty much, or at least sponsored uh, its invention. So then, of course, the first uh, winter AI winter showed up, which means um, the traditional symbolic approaches did not pan out at all. There were people uh, studying linguistics using logical formalisms, and they were doing object recognition using traditional programming approaches and so forth. But then the thing that really made AI's resurgence come, come, back, come back after like two winters was Mr. Rosenblatt's perceptron. Now, after they trashed his work, why is it that now suddenly everybody's up in arms again? I know, no longer up in arms against perceptrons. Well, that's easy. So it turns out that... Uh, a fellow called Hinton, he um, realized that if you put these things in layers, so not just, so Mr. Rosenblatt had the misfortune of not having computers to do this automatic tuning of these parameters. So he had to do this manually. And he also didn't realize that he had to introduce a nonlinearity. That's all he had to introduce. And that's the reason why we have those sigmoid and ReLU functions that I showed you. So the moment you introduce nonlinearity and then you add layers like this, it turns out that these perceptrons become far more robust and much more general. So it is, in fact, there is a theorem which says uh, a multi-layer perceptron like this can implement any mathematical function as long as you know how to train those weights. But then, of course, there are hundreds of millions of these weights. And so human beings cannot clearly do this by hand. So there must be a better way. And a better way was invented in the late 80s by Hinton and others who actually got the Turing Award for this, by the way. And that is something called backpropagation. And I'll you know, very briefly tell you what backpropagation is about. So if you've got an image of this lion, for example, and then you want the label of that network to identify it as a lion, what you do is you present this image and of course it's going to give you some garbage, right? It'll give you some wrong answer. So now you take the distance between the answer that is desired and the wrong answer, 
and you sort of keep tweaking these weights till that distance sort of gets closer and closer to what you want. And you keep training this, quote unquote, by presenting hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of these images. And then as you keep doing this, the process you know, eventually converges and then you end up with um, labels that are more precise and accurate than human beings can, can guess by sight alone. So it gets really, really you know, uh, good, really, really fast. But then of course the attendant problem is there are certain situations where the thing is gonna be wrong but just looking at the complexity of this network, there's no way to tell exactly where it's going to go wrong. And so that is the subject of my research. So if I take this and put it into an aircraft, which they are doing, by the way, just you know, for you guys to be comfortable with this idea, um, and then the thing suddenly makes the aircraft veer off the runway and crash onto the side, then they say, whoops, sorry, we just didn't realize that it w didn't work, w wouldn't work under this situation. So we don't want this to happen, do we? No. So therefore, I'm a part of the FAA ESA response to the drone problem, which was uh, a working group was stood up by the SAE, with the, which, which used to be called the System for Automotive, I mean, Society for Automotive Engineers. And it's now just an acronym because it's gone beyond that. And uh, this, this organization has been around for over 50, 50 or 60 years. And uh, some of the luminaries uh, who founded this organization included Amelia Earhart and Orwell, Orwell Wright and so on. And so they have stood up what is called the G34 Committee on um, Process Standard for Development and Certification of Aeronautical Safety-Related Products Implementing AI. So we know that people are just rearing to, to implement AI, including Boeing and Airbus and Collins and you know, all these large organizations. But then the FAA and uh, the DOD is taking a very critical look at the technology they're developing. And one of the things we did was to put out a, uh, a, a document called AIR 6988, which you can actually buy. And it's called Artificial Intelligence and Aeronautical Systems Statement of Concerns. And the concerns expressed are along the lines of what I just said when I was talking about multi-layer perceptrons. And then we are developing the standard, which is going to be coming out like in 2023, I would say, ish. I don't know exactly where, when. But then of course, I'm also trying to um, promote this within the DOD. And I, when I started working on this like two or three years ago, I found that there was a dearth of material available within the DOD where people were not paying attention to the um, assurance of autonomous systems and were simply uh, mimicking whatever it is that Facebook and others were doing with their AI. And I'll show, you know, during this talk, I will demonstrate that it's a bad idea to just copy whatever it is that those guys are doing into our military systems, which can lead to catastrophic um, failures, as we just saw with the, with the aircraft. All right. So this is in order to prevent similar disasters in the commercial area. But what about the DOD? And that's where I think uh, we have to be very careful in evangelizing the right spreading the right word. And I've been working with the Joint AI Center, Jake, on some of these activities, but um, I don't think they also understand the extent of the problem. Okay, so the, why is it that we are so enamored by this AI? For the third time, this is kind of like, you know, Charlie Brown trying to go and kick the ball and Lucy is holding it up for him. And in spite of repeatedly being struck down by her pulling the ball away, ball away he again, goes back and starts doing it. So why is it that we fall prey to this AI hype for the third time? Or maybe this is even the fourth time, right? And then um, believe that it's gonna solve world hunger. Well, it's because of four fallacies. And I will again go through some of these fallacies. So they think that narrow intelligence is on a continuum with general intelligence. Even um, Mr. Herb Simon was of the opinion that if you can solve you know, one problem, then of course we can solve all problems because all we have to do is just put in more rules. And so Deep Blue, remember Deep Blue, which was the first step in an AI revolution? This happened, what, 15, 20 years ago? We are still waiting for the revolution. Watson was another hype. IBM spent more than a billion dollars on Watson because it was the first step into cognitive systems. And GPT-3 is now the, the darling, media darling. Um, promoted by OpenAI, one of uh, Elon Musk's um, organizations, and it's a step towards general intelligence, they say. Wow, so cool. 
easy things are hard and hard things are easy, which was recognized by John McCarthy, the, who coined the term AI, who lamented that AI is harder than we thought. And Marvin Minsky explained that this is because easy things are hard. And of course, it's also because the press and the general public are lulled into a false sense of optimism because of these wishful mnemonics, as I call them. Neural networks, oh wow. Machine learning and deep learning. Watson can read all of the healthcare texts. No, it can't. Watson doesn't understand anything at all about those texts. It's just looking at the syntax. AlphaGo's goal is to beat the best human players. AlphaGo does not think, nor does it have a goal. And we can always ask AlphaGo how well it thinks. And it thought it would win. It never thought it would win. <laughs> Humans who looked at AlphaGo thought it would win. And finally, uh, intelligence is all that we need for a conscious mind, which even Mr. Herb Simon in his um, heyday uh, used to espouse that understanding co for understanding cognition, we don't have to worry about unconscious or perceptual processes. All we have to understand is logic, okay, which didn't get us very far. All right. So my objective, for the, again, I can't go into the details of this project because we are also running out of time. And so we know that naval autonomous systems based on machine learning, in particular deep learning, using those multi-layer perceptrons, is going to be a, a, a factor with um, deploying, being deployed in systems such as radar systems, EW systems, cruise missiles, UUVs, USVs, UAVs. They are going to be deployed widely. And I'm just going to draw your attention to the misclassification errors that these systems are prone to. And therefore, we have to be very careful about assurance of these systems. And so I'll use all this different terminology, which I think doesn't matter now because I'm not going to go to the depth that I thought I would go into. So um, what is the problem? What is dependability? So I de define dependability uh, as follows. So at three levels, Levels. You want to, first of all, make sure that the system is safe. And by that, we mean no unintended engagements, which is along the lines of DOD Directive 3000.09, which is about autonomy in weapon systems. And if people have not read this, even though it's, what, almost a decade old, you should read this because it talks about minimizing consequences of failure that may lead to unintended engagements. And the uh, the UAV that we saw that crashed into other people's homes almost is about an unintended engagement. And so this is not possible to be guaranteed by using statistical methods alone, which is what Mr. Musk and other company and the people there are doing with their self-driving cars. Because we have to take the worst case into account. And so if grandma gets hit by a driver, you can't say, well, she's just a statistic. No, grandma is important. And we want to make sure that the system does not go and kill grandma. And so that is not a statistical argument. But reliability is, we can say it should op operate under normal operating conditions 99.999% of the time or something, which is you know something that we can do with statistical methods. And finally, in order to be able to trust the decision-making of these AI-based systems, we want to make sure that the humans understand the thought processes are, in fact, the, the decision-making processes underlying the decision. So, for example, if you're talking about a commander who is unleashing a cruise missile that has AI built into it, the, the standard metrics do not apply, right? So you do not know what the, the PK, the probability of kill, is going to be. We don't know what the, the overall ellipse, error ellipse is going to look like and so on. So unless these things are properly discussed and uh, enunciated, these systems will be very dangerous if you deploy them tactically. And so to start this discussion off, um, we ran a workshop called the called TADM, Trusted Automated Decision Making, and we brought luminaries from all over the world to speak at our forum. And we are continuing to, to, to hold these workshops on a annual or you know, semi-annual basis, um, all way, all, all the uh, around the world. The past one was uh, virtually held in Luxembourg, and we are, you know, stay tuned for other workshops. All right. So, um, one thing that I want to showcase here is how good enough decisions are not accurate for neural networks. So, you look again. This is, you know, I apologize. There's no animation here, but then if you have the red dots and you've got the blue dots. 
and you want to draw a line which separates the red dots from the blue dots, um, a human being would just draw a horizontal line, right? Like the one I show in green. And that's the ideal decision boundary. And this is also what a Bayesian classifier will do. But a neural network will instead draw a line which looks like um, the one that's inclined at 30 degrees to the horizontal. And that's because it looks at what are called empirical risk minimization boundaries. And by dint of the fact that we are kind of um, minimizing a cost function, it really doesn't matter if the outliers, you know, the small red blob and the small blue blob are misclassified because the overall classification error is still significantly lower than what you can get um, by manual methods alone. And so I think this is really what the data sparsity problem is. And so again, I don't have the time to get into the details, but essentially this is in essence, the reason why there are, there are misclassifications. And so we are trying to mitigate this by performing some formal analysis of the boundaries. So, um, so to conclude, um, there are several levels of criticality. So we call this leveling in ML-based systems. We start off by looking at things that are non-critical. For example, Facebook's um, face tagging of Instagram pictures falls in this category. So if you mistag a face, um, well, nothing drastic is going to happen, except that, you know, maybe there is a private eye. He's uh, going behind some person who's, you know, accused of a crime or something. And then Facebook mis mistakenly tags that person being among a gang of people or something. And then that may have some legal consequences. But other than that, you know, misidentifying a species of birds or recommending the wrong movie, all that you're going to do is maybe throw the remote control on the TV screen because you hate that movie, but it's not that critical. But now even commercial systems are getting to what is called level one and your pecuniary interests are being compromised by these AIs. So for example, automated trading, credit card fraud alerts, how many people have had their credit cards locked because of some mistaken assumption by your uh, bank? about the, the activities being deemed fraudulent. So that was, again, it just makes you very unhappy, but um, credit worthiness assessment that you can actually be denied credit because some AI said that you're not credit worthy. So one has to be careful even at this level, but then it's being taken a, a step further. Level two is where you can do things like recidivism assessment for, for um, parole um, hearings where AIs are being used to, to determine whether or not this person is going to be uh, a risk when granted parole. And this is done using special purpose software that are um, inscrutable because they claim proprietary technology. And so prison systems are actually using the software without anyone understanding how or why these decisions are being made. And so at my workshop, TADM, uh, Cynthia Rudin, a professor at Duke, um, talked about the hazards associated with this kind of uh, systems being injected into society. Um, automated radiologists. Oh, I can go on and on about this for a whole hour. But Stanford, very Stanford hospitals, uh, very proudly showcased this uh, automated radiologist, and then they realized that the kind of decisions were, that were being made were being made on very egregious grounds, you know, such as whether or not. Um, a mark has been made against the, the, the lesion or close to the lesion. And so um, they, they were all embarrassed and red faced about this. So even for lifestyle choices, uh, one has to be very careful using AI. But of course, now we get to the red zone where we have cyber critic physical systems, which means there are systems that are safety critical, such as drones, firefighting robots, explosive ordnance disposal robots, and so forth. And since they interact with other entities in the environment, in the physical world, one has to be extremely careful fielding AI because um, them going rogue like the aircraft did is going to have very serious consequences. And of course, once you start using this at level four, um, nuclear reactor control, power grids, automated warfighting systems, uh, you know, the Air Force's Skyborg program comes to mind. Nuclear tipped missiles, again, you know, now they are redoing all the, the ballistic missiles that carry nuclear missiles, uh, nuclear um, warheads. I sure hope the AI there is um, 
well vetted before they put it in. So that's so the, the levels of um, criticality, they have a very important part in whether or not we can depend on these systems and the societal impacts of this. But I have done some research on some you know very simple challenges. So for example, I didn't even go into this, but this is when you take a picture of a cat, which the AI says is a cat, and then you just add some imperceptible noise, and then it says, now this is a panda. And again, we really do not have defenses against such an attack, which we call an adversarial perturbation. And so my research is all about, you know, formalizing this, in which I shall not go into this in, in terms of math, and then having a hardening process where we can at least harden the system not to be falling prey to these adversarial examples. And that's what my research is all about. And then why, are, why is the Navy interested in this? Because unmanned and autonomous systems are being deployed now, especially for missions that are dirty, dull, and dangerous. And it's going to be an increasingly important um, component of a broad range of defense systems, including autonomous systems. And the DOD, um, DSP report on design and acquisition of software for defense systems explicitly spelled out that laboratories should establish research and experimentation programs around the practical use of ML in defense systems with testing IV and V and resiliency and hardening as a primary focus. With that, I shall conclude and um, invite any questions. Awesome. Thank you, Ramesh. Uh, we, we did have a couple questions come through. So I'm going to go ahead and share those. So they are shown on the screen and then we'll go through them one at a time. For those who are just listening in and not able to see the screen, I'll, I'll go ahead and just uh, state the question and you can go ahead and respond to this, Ramesh. Okay. Uh, so the letter 6988 was released just like about a month ago, and I'm not even sure it's available for purchase yet, but it has been released into the public domain. You have to check with SAE as and when you can buy this this product. But it's out there. I think it's just about a month or two old. Okay, that was and that again that was a question about Air Six Nine Eighty Eight. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me go ahead and uh, I'll just list this question out. So the question is: How important is system engineer is the system engineering and hardware components for of AI for advancement? of trusted AI applications? I would say that's the most important thing because <laughs> we have supply chain attacks, not just against software, but also against hardware components. Mm. So I think we have to take this holistic approach to both software and hardware, if you want to make any progress. And so we were mistakenly under the impression until now at Hatsi that we can just take someone else's hardware and then just put all our trusted stuff on top of it. But just going into COTS with all these Spectre and Meltdown um, vulnerabilities, I would say that we have to completely take care of, you know, take over the supply chain and uh, trusted foundry notwithstanding. I think the DOD is doing very little in trying to uh, establish trust in this systems engineering point of view, especially when I see open source software being used in very critical weapon systems. And that's not good. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, that's a, a good response to that question. The next one is, uh, is there a commonly accepted metric for degree of trusted algorithm or trusted AI? Does it factor expectations of the user with capabilities instilled by the designer? Okay, so there is, uh, it's a two-part answer. Um, it's highly dependent upon the level of criticality of the system and also the efficacy of the AI. So, for example, if you're talking about um, machine translation, I you know, encountered a number of documents in other languages, you know, uh, Canada or Greek or French or Mandarin Chinese. And rather than not being able to understand any of it, if I just put it into Google Translate and give and I get a rough idea of what that means, I can sort of use my gray cells to fill in the blanks or sort of make corrections to mistakes so that I still have a fairly good idea what, what the document is saying. So for such a situation, I would say, I can trust Google Translate. But then if this is actually being used for other purposes, for example, to um, criminalize someone or to um, use it as a legal document, it's completely unacceptable, right? Mm -hmm. So it is not just the level of trust that you demand, but also upon the level of performance that you get. And face tagging is another area where Facebook 
has used this uh, weekly supervised learning to tag all the pictures on Instagram. So they first sucked in all the pictures of Instagram and then they used tagging that was kind of um, rough by people and they use that as data, raw data upon which they can train their AI and now it's going off willy-nilly tagging people automatically. Now, what is the accuracy of this tagging? Not very high. What are the you know the, the consequences of something being mistagged? Like I said, it could be pretty high, you know, in very strange or bizarre situations, but for the general public, they love it. They say, wow, Facebook is so smart. It's not tagging me. Mm. Well, not really, right? Mm. So I think the expectations of the user is definitely something that we have to keep in mind. And I think the, the best um, place I can point you guys to in what they call uh, ML ops, just like we have DevOps and DevSecOps, uh, OpenAI uh, uh, is is going towards this, at least to try to categorize exactly where the boundaries are and where you can be reliably uh, efficient and where you should not at all, under any circumstances, use this technology. Um, and so you can uh, watch Andrew Ng's uh, uh, several presentations on uh, Coursera. Yeah, that's all great. Right. Next question, uh, about slide 12. It says, uh, slide 12 states something to the fact that system actions are intelligent, secure, fair. Can you elaborate on the fairness aspect of that bullet point? In, in warfare, there is no fairness. Well, that is, okay. So I'll tell you exactly what fairness means. It's probably not what you guys think that is fairness, uh, it, what, what the term means. So by fairness, this, this is a technical um, definition of fairness, which you may or may not agree with, <laughs> is when you uh, look at those smaller dots, like I said, you know, I showed you this big red dot, where everything gets classified fine. But then there is a smaller red dot, which where people get misclassified, let's say for face tagging. And you know, this Google AI made this very famous mistake of uh, misidentifying an African-American face as that of a gorilla. And they got a lot of flack for this. Was this intentional? No, that was just a consequence of the learning process. They had no idea it was doing this. And the reason why it did it is because the data set that they created for tagging faces was predominantly of a certain category that was available on the internet. And it turns out that on the internet, you have uh, a lot more of non-African American faces than you have of African American faces properly tagged. And this also happens with diseases. You know, So the exact reason why radiologists are so enamored by AI is it doesn't miss these off the charts, kind of you know, very, very rare disease. But now if you have not given it sufficient number of samples of that rare disease, that is precisely the point where the thing is going to fail. Okay, so this is uh, you know, what is called the small data problem, which means if you're looking for a rare disease to be diagnosed by the AI and you don't give it sufficient data because it's rare, obviously, right? Then it is going to make mistakes precisely under those situations where you expect it to be correct. Very good, so that's, that's, what that's the definition of fairness that you're using. Yeah, that's the definition of fairness I'm using, and I'm sticking Understood. to it. <laughs> Understood. All right. Next question. Next question asks if you could uh, speak briefly to the kinds of formal methods that you're using to model and reason about the DNS, DNN-based systems and constraints on their behaviors. Okay. So um, there are you know, at least three or four different approaches uh, to this problem, and I think the first, the the pioneers here were um, uh, a group of people associated with the Professor Dill, formerly at Stanford and now at Facebook. And they uh, use something called a system called ReluPlex. And there have been several follow-on systems that are based on you know, linear programming approaches. And so it only went that far. So for example, if you take the BB-8 self-driving car of NVIDIA, it is a neural network that just does soup to nuts self-driving in terms of identifying objects, localization, and so on. It has about a quarter of a million neurons. And if you go to GPT-3, that has a 175 billion connections or something like that. But um, these uh, systems, including their follow-up systems, formal methods-based systems, they can do 3,000 neurons if you're lucky. And then now people are also using something called um, abstract interpretation. And this is pioneered by people at uh, ETH uh, Zurich that I work with. 
and their system is even worse you know so they are really trying to contain the the the, uh, the constrain the output at least understand where the, the constraints are on the outputs of these neural networks when you have a constrained input so these abstract interpretation based systems they can go i don't know 20 neurons maybe 30 before they just run out of memory and then again you know if you are familiar with formal methods there is this thing called cigar that was invented by Ed Clark and people who, you know, also got the Turing Award for this. Counterexample guided abstraction refinement. So they do some similar approaches. And, and I was always contending that this never works. Right from 2000, when I presented my paper on um, inductive approaches to verification, I said, CIGAR does not work. And it's still um, pretty clear that it doesn't work. But people are still doing the same thing for neural network based systems. But I think one thing that um, has really helped is something called binary neural networks where they are constraining the outputs to just zero and one and not you know, using uh, numerical um, outputs versus just categorical outputs. And so there the network, uh, the, the formal methods actually seem to work. But we are using a combination of both. Yeah, we have our own approach. And so we are using a combination of both um, um, perturbations you know, within bounds for which you want to prove the correctness of networks. And I think uh, Nicholas Carlini, uh, who gave a talk at NeurIPS 2020, said that that is the only defense that ever seems to work. And he considered 13 other defenses that did not work. Very good. All right, thanks. Let's jump to the next question. Um, says, will the acquisition of clean training be, more, be another security problem one day? Oh, totally. Totally. I mean, especially when we are, see the thing is, I'm talking about DOD systems where I think uh, we have control over the cleanliness of the cl training data. But I think Andrew Ng, for example, brings out other insidious problems with uh, tagging of photos using approaches such as Mechanical Turk, where if you take a picture, and I have this problem all the time when I do the captures, when they say traffic lights and they ask you to check the squares that contain traffic lights. Do you also have to, in to include the poles or do I not have to include the poles? And it turns out that you should not include the poles because then it'll deem that to be incorrect. Right? So you only have to include the lights and not the fixtures that are supporting those lights. So similarly, if you've got you know, two cats, you know, one in front of the other, then where does the other cat begin and where does, does this one start, end? And so do we put two boxes? And so there are like hundreds of, of these problems um, of tagging correctly. And of course, you also have you know this this whole idea of data poisoning, where you can deliberately someone mistags a, da a data point, and it turns out that if you've got a whole corpus of a million images, and you sometimes mistag one of them, that can completely throw off the classifier, and it can start classifying things completely wrongly based on this one um, bad apple in the in the <laughs> bin, if you will. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah. but I, I'm not going into this because that's not my problem. It's not a DoD problem because we hope that we can curate it ourselves. <laughs> All right, this, this the last Famous question. Fact. Last question so far. It says, uh, could you please talk a bit more about your research in the robustness uh, robustness verification of neural networks? Uh, sure, so for which I can maybe go back sharing my screen because I very quickly went through the slide, which I sure. think I can now project and see if people can see it. One second. Yeah. I'll end Real the quick. Okay, so do you see this? Now, if I go into presentation mode, do you see it? Um, no, it still is only showing the uh, the PowerPoint kind of um, application itself, not the presentation. Okay, so this had actually had animations. Okay, so this ah. is in essence what Mr. Carlini said works, and I had actually proposed this in 2018 to the DoD, and still going strong is you want to show, so this is a very narrowly defined um, objective that we are having, and that is this problem, which is what I call local robustness, which means that if you've got a, 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 an image properly classified as a cat, and you add noise, imperceptible, imperceptible noise to it so that it starts being misclassified as a panda, then how do you prevent these kind of adversarial examples? So that's the narrow focus of my research. And so what we are trying to do here is to sort of mimic what human cognition does. So you've got a human function, f, 
and we have got a neural network that is trying to mimic the operation of this function f hat. And then the idea here is every time the f hat differs from f for a certain image, you call this an adversarial example. And the perturbation of the image, that is the delta xi that caused this misclassification error is called an adversarial perturbation. So you pretty much want to make sure that you, for all adversarial perturbations of interest, you will not cause a misclassification error. And so here is an example of what, this was actually invented by Goodfellow who actually, uh, you know, was in what, 20, so in neural network terms, 2015 is kind of like, you know, decades old, right? So you only refer to research that's like last week, <laughs> even last month is probably too old. So anyway, so this was what I um, proposed and we are working on right now is to perturb the image. So this cat image can be perturbed with, with several norms, you know, within a given norm, you perturb the image and then you see what the neural network does. And of course, you also have to put in defenses. You know, so you've got domain adaptation, noise injection filters and stochastic activity sheet pruning, you do all that stuff. And then you make sure that there are no yes answers. Right. So it does it, you know, so when you um, um, cause a misclassification, you go back and then you add that to the training data set. And you also add other augmented images derived from um, synthetic data generation to fill in that hole, if you will. You know, remember I was talking about this data sparsity. So precisely under those conditions where there are there, there is sparse data, you have to go and augment it either by going and taking pictures of other cats in that given pose or you create a synthetic cat and you sort of real, you know, you, you kind of make this picture real enough so that I can add those perturbations into my training set and then retrain. And then after I'm, I'm finally going to get done, this is kind of like SIGAR, but I'm going to get done when I will not get any misclassification errors given the perturbations within what we call the ball. So which means you've got the image, you perturb it all around it, which is kind of like a proverbial ball around the image. And for each of those perturbations, if the answer is still a cat, then I'm getting some assurance that uh, it's going to be less vulnerable to these adversarial examples. So that's my research. Oh, perfect. What? Well, hey, that was our last question. Um, and I, it, we're, we are over the time here, one o'clock. So I appreciate your mesh sticking, sticking out with us, answering some of the questions and apologize to everybody for the late start. Um, if there are any other follow-up questions, I'm sure they can get in touch with your mesh and they could, uh, Sure. I have my email address uh, up on the slides and feel free to email me or. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or we can help get them in touch with you. So if there are any other questions, go to dsi.org or directly to Ramesh and we'd be happy to, to help uh, make some connections or answer some technical questions. So, hey, thank you for the presentation, Ramesh, and for the time and for everybody else for joining us. Hope you all have a great afternoon or evening. Oh, thank you, Brian and Sharon, for organizing this. I really had a blast uh, in spite of, you know, technical difficulties and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But I think um, I got the message across, which is important. Yes, very much. Thank you so much. All right, Bye. take care. You too.